Okay, cool. And then we'll go ahead and hit present here. Where did Dickens there go? All right, awesome. So we're, I know we're running uh, five minutes late, fortunately, but I appreciate everyone's patience and coming here today. Uh, I know a lot of you probably came here from the, uh, the flyers, which is awesome. Uh, you can tell by the fact that I had to pen in the word Friday on a, like a hundred plus of them, uh, that I'm not the best graphic designer, although I'll take credit for the logo. Uh, but that being said, I wanted to go ahead and start off the uh, second workshop. So we had an original meeting, um, Tim was here as well. That was just kind of a, a, an introductory um, very, very rudimentary uh, introduction to the uses of quantum computation, because, you know, I, I have to motivate you guys to stick around somehow. Otherwise, I'm just teaching you something that a normal computer can do. There's not really much uh, interesting uh, to be done there other than, say, power efficiency. But that being said, uh, after that lesson, I wanted to kind of kick off with this um, algorithm here, deutsch hose um, deutsch hose is not meant to be a useful algorithm. Uh, I did promise, though, that near the end of the quarter, I'd start producing workshops where I'll have you guys work on actual problems. So for um, BQE, we'll be simulating uh, the ground state for different molecules, or um, there are certain uh, combinatorial optimization problems that pop up very often in industry, and you'll find that to be uh, a lot more interactive. So there'll be an actual code example. I'll ask you guys to bring your laptops. But uh, this time around, I, uh, I figured I'd, I'd try and keep things as uh, friendly as possible. Um, before I go any further, there were some interesting questions from the involvement fair I wanted to ask. I thought it was uh, pretty interesting. Uh, so one is, uh, does UC Davis have a uh, quantum computer or a processor? Because uh, you know, the, I think the University of Maryland has one going for them. Uh, they're working in collaboration with uh, IonQ. That's another private company. I think uh, the national laboratories here in the United States, especially Lawrence Livermore and uh, one of my former workplaces, Sandia National Labs has one. Uh, but UC Davis does not. We have an NMR system, uh, a nucleo, nuclear magnetic resonance system, but that's usually for um, imaging purposes. You can use that methodology for quantum computing, but I don't think the school has it set up for stuff like that. So unfortunately, we're not as prestigious as some of the Ivy Leagues that have their own fancy little uh, things to play around with. Uh, what do you do at workshops? I think I got this question a couple of times. Uh, so at the beginning, it's gonna, it's gonna look very much like what I'm doing right now. So I'll be presenting you guys with some information. And uh, one of the things I wanna encourage is if you have any questions, regardless of your background, or feel free to you know, stop me right then and there. Uh, just because uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a pretty comfy sized, uh, comfortably sized, excuse me, organization. I'm not, I'm not your professor. I'm not here to roll my eyes at you if you ask something that you know, is uh, you know, uh, seemingly silly or anything like that. In fact, the entire nature of quantum mechanics is incredibly weird. So I anticipate uh, a good deal of questions. So that being said, um, oh, if I'm going too fast, let me know, by the way, I have a, I have a tendency to kind of speak quickly sometimes. Uh, I was looking at the other recording that I made for the beginning workshop, and I do seem to um, quicken the pace. But uh, um, you're more than welcome to tell me to slow down or, or repeat something. Um, I'm very welcome to do that. So these are the uh, objectives that I have for today. And it seems like a lot. Uh, I don't know how far we'll be able to get in terms of the last bullet point, which is Deutsch Hose, but we will definitely cover um, Deutsch's algorithm. So I, I do want a, a quick recap from the last workshop. So that'll be great for you guys who, um, have, uh, who haven't seen the last workshop or weren't in attendance. Um, I'm just, just taking like, I think just one or two key points from that last workshop. And then I have some uh, visualization Oh, well, see, there, there I go again. This is um, in inaccurate. I cut out the block sphere and the visualization stuff. Every canonical introduction, not every canonical, but, but every introduction to quantum computing always throws the block sphere at you, which involves me having to do a little bit of trigonometric uh, magic in front of you guys to uh, represent a quantum state. But I've opted to omit that just because I wanted to prioritize the uh, Brockett notation. Brockett notation comes up uh, naturally in quantum mechanics. It's just a very nice way to uh, represent a lot of the math that goes on. It's, a, it's a, like another layer of abstraction because you'll be dealing with vectors and matrices. But uh, Dirac came up with this very nice way to ha ha cover all that up. And it's very much uh, as a child would play with puzzle pieces, um, as you'll soon see. Uh, measurement, so the idea I had originally I mentioned like superposition. Okay, so you have a different probability of getting a zero and a one, but how exactly does the uh, superposition superposition collapse? Right. So if Subit has this kind of uh, a linear combination, I want to make sure you guys understand. Well, you know how how can I get the probability of what it's going to be? Uh, global and relative phase. Uh, that's something that will come up over and over in all sorts of different quantum algorithms. It's I think it's a very important topic that a lot of uh, LinkedIn posts and and medium articles seem to brush to the side in favor of showing you shiny new gadgets. 
Uh, and then gates and linearity go hand in hand. So gates are the ways we manipulate our individual quantum gates. So just like how our normal computers have logic gates, our quantum computers have their own set of gates. And uh, linearity is a property of those gates. In fact, it's a, a more fundamental mathematical property, but I am intentionally keeping um, the, the sort of underlying rules uh, as light as possible. Because I don't want to uh, throw a bunch of math that you probably won't encounter until this uh, next or, or the next to next uh, workshop. And then the two algorithms that I wanted to pay attention to today are Deutsch and uh, Deutoza. And if you wonder what the difference is, Deutsch only works for inputs that are um, one bit. And then Deutsch Hose is where we've expanded it to an arbitrary number of qubits. And the math does come out to be different for both of them. But you need to understand the principles behind the Deutsch's original algorithm to make sense of why Deutsch Hose works the way it does. Well, yeah, this is all that I, I wanted to recap from the last workshop. So if you weren't in attendance, uh, I guess that's a hats off to you. Um, so qubits can be in a superposition state between zero and one. So that enables what we call uh, a quantum parallelism. That's the idea that uh, traditionally, if I have a, a function, it would take me multiple iterations to evaluate that function for different inputs. So I could have f of zero and f of one and f of two, and I'd have to plug in and get the result, plug in and get the result, like rinse and repeat. But if we use our uh, qubits in such a way, we can uh, uh, simultaneously evaluate um, all these different values, all these potential inputs at one, in one call. So I don't have to evaluate f of x multiple times. There's one caveat to that though. You can't get all the results out. So what do I, what exactly do I mean by that? Um, so we, we plug in what I called that superposition state earlier, and then you'll get out uh, a superposition state. But when you're, when you get out that superposition state, you can't technically extract all the individual pieces of information, the complex coefficients that are associated with it. Um, they're, uh, because of the whole collapse, uh, you have to interfere with the system to get the data out. The superposition that you're in will uh, come to a single traditional uh, value. So from a qubit to a, a normal bit. So if I had uh, two qubits that could be in binary, anywhere from zero to three, I could only get the value zero, the value one. I mean, you could try and uh, get some more information out by repeatedly performing measurements. And that will give you like, a, so like maybe out of a hundred measurements, you get uh, uh, 10 of them might be zero, 20 of them might be um, one, and then all the other. So you can get some more information out, but that still doesn't give you all the information. It's still uh, quite wasteful. Eventually, if you, <laughs> if you keep doing these shots over and over, your performance benefit is gone. Um, so ideally, you want to keep the number of evaluations as small as possible. Oh, I have two objectives, huh? Oh, so, okay, now I go to the uh, digital blackboard. Originally, I would have liked to use the physical blackboard just because we might have, uh, let me check if there are any people on the, uh, any participants here? Uh, none, okay, that's fine. But it's all being recorded. So hopefully you can see up uh, on here. If you can't see up here, I'd recommend like you can move over there. Uh, yeah, there's no, damn, there's no uh, uh, projector there. Let me go ahead and open up. All right, you guys can see that. Let me do a new share here. Right. So one note, cool beans. Okay, how does everyone, how does everyone feel so far that brief introduction? All right, cool, very good. I think I, I saw some of your names come up on the uh, email. So I'll, I'll have you added to the uh, mailing list and then you'll see all the um, future workshops. But the social media is also like, you can also find us there. All right. Uh, no Instagram. You know, I, I don't think there's any there's much I can really post on IG. <laughs> we usually just stick to the stuffier stuff like LinkedIn and, uh, and Facebook, which I guess isn't as stuffy, but um, I guess even with our generation, it seems to be kind of antiquated at this point. Oh, let's see if I can. Okay, sweet. I'm just making sure the pen works here. So I wanted to go over the Brockett notation here. And last time I mentioned that a singular qubit, one qubit can either be in this um, superposition state like so. And I, last time I also told you to treat, just treat these as zero and one. So you could have, back in the first workshop, you could have ignored the fancy little uh, uh, triangle that seems to encapsulate the zero and one. But this time I have to kind of uh, uh, bring you into the real world and, and how we actually do stuff here. Uh, so your, your alpha and beta are, are coefficients. They're um, complex value. Oh, whoops. Your complex value coefficients. 
and they are what we call the probability amplitudes uh, because they do represent the probability you can get a, a zero or a, a one upon measurement. So when your superposition collapses, but uh, there's a, a, a uh, not a restraint, a constraint that is imposed on them, which is if you take the magnitude squared of each of alpha and beta, or all your coefficients, because um, eventually I'll show you how to do multiple qubits, and uh, you will each qubit will have an associated coefficient, but all of them, when you take the magnitude and you square it, it should all add up to one, which intuitively makes sense because the probability of something happening, uh, the most you can get is that your one means it's guaranteed to happen. And then you have your decimal range, and so like 0 0.3 or 0 0.5. And this, this converts um, the values to uh, uh, all these become real values. So these, uh, these are no longer complex. They have a, like a, a physical meaning that's useful to us. And the other thing that I, I've mentioned or hinted at in the last workshop is that the 0 and 1 here are vectors. So they're not actually uh, you know, singular scalar values. Um, the 0 is actually represented as a, a two entry vector like this. And then your one is represented like this. These are just your um, two vectors. Uh, there are some important properties I want to point out here. These are unit vectors, so they have a length of one, and they're orthogonal to each other. So if I were to take the uh, dot product of these two, um, you'd get zero because they're perfectly orthogonal. In fact, the fancy name we use for it is uh, orthonormal. It's because uh, when you get higher and higher in any field of study, they come up with more and more uh, ridiculous jargon. Uh, let's see. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention with uh, the Brockhead notation is anything that encapsulates anything that anytime you see this, and it doesn't matter what's in here. I could I could put like an any um, letter, uh, a Greek letter. I could put in literally the word stuff. You can choose whatever arbitrary label you want, but uh, underlying it is some kind of uh, a vector. And usually, what happens is just because I don't want to keep writing this over and over, um, I'll represent the entire state. Um, you can represent the entire state as a single um, ket here. That's what it's called. Triangles are called. Um, oh, let's get into the end of my drawing board here. Out here. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> Oh, down my Right, so uh, uh, going back here, so I mentioned like, you know, I could, I could put any arbitrary label here. And what actually happens is this can still represent the uh, original, the original multiple kets that we saw earlier. So if we have the alpha here, plus beta one. And, and that doesn't, um, this just means like, this is still a singular vector with two entries, which is it, it, it kind of seems confusing because you've got two vectors here. Then you realize that because this has entries one and zero, this is entries zero and one, um, your final vector actually just comes out to be these uh, individual coefficients here, alpha and beta. So they're encapsulated inside that singular vector. And we can go ahead and save ourselves a, a, a decent amount of time by just representing a singular qubit with one ket. And uh, um, for those that come from a physics background or are going into physics, you'll see this notation outside of quantum computing. And um, this is uh, purely from uh, quantum mechanics back in uh, Dirac's time. So before anyone even started thinking about um, if you could use uh, quantum mechanics for computational purposes. Now I want to uh, go back to one thing that I, I pointed out. I, I want to show some manipulations with these uh, bras and cats that I think will you'll see over and over again as you keep working your way through the field of quantum computing. Let me ask the question of what happens if we have more than one qubit? So let's say uh, uh, we'll just do two qubits. So mathematically, how would I go about uh, representing that? Go ahead and uh, spoil the answer here. Um, okay, hold on. Sorry, I keep having to do this weird scrolling thing. I think when I extend the display, the resolution uh, resolution on my machine increases, but the drawing board only lets me access half the lab, the monitor. So I got to keep scrolling up. But if you need to see anything that I, I wrote previously, uh, feel free to um, ask me and I'll, I'm more than willing to um, and scroll back up here. So if I have two qubits, uh, I'll call this qubit uh, A and qubit B. 
So uh, this makes sense for now because, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, one qubit is a two entry vector. But now we have to find a way to kind of glue these guys together. We want to represent it as a, a singular vector. And the way we go about that is we take the tensor product of these two. Anytime you see two cats that are right next to each other, like so, and it doesn't matter what the labels are, you take the tensor product of them and that creates a, an even bigger vector. So I can go ahead and give a, a very simple example here. Um, let's see, so I'll just use CD and then EF here. So these would be our two vectors here. And if we take the tensor product, um, that I always think of the tensor product as kind of lazier matrix multiplication because you don't have to worry about um, the dot product. You're getting the uh, order. Um, as it's not as sensitive to that kind of stuff. So if I do, that's C and D, right? So that was our, our first vector, and this is our second one. And then I copy and paste the second one two times over, like so. And we just multiply them straight across. Now we have a four entry vector, and that represents the um, total system uh, with two qubits. So C, E, C, F, and then that'd be D, E, and D, F. Now, I just wanted to go back to the first workshop. I mentioned there are certain times where you will have two physically distinct qubits, but you can get them in such a state, mathematically speaking, that you can't go back. I can't take this uh, vector with four entries and decompose it into two. And that's what we call an entangled state. You can no longer describe it as a singular mathematical entity. It has to be treated as one whole thing. And there's some very uncanny properties. Like if I were to uh, physically separate the qubits, there's still this kind of instantaneous um, effect. Although, I'm, and I'm encouraging you to watch the um, last workshop, I, I did show that it's not possible to use that for faster than light communication. That's one of the hunches, like, you know, when people uh, first encountered this, Einstein was very upset with it because he thought it, but eventually it poked a hole through it and they realized like you can't, you can't transmit any useful inspiration uh, faster than the speed of light. So, but I, but I digress. I just wanted to bring that up here. So basically, when you have any, 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 you know, any two cats, oh, good Lord, if you have any two cats like this, um, you can immediately tensor product them and it becomes one cat in itself. And usually the tradition that you'll see is if um, the labels will get combined together too. So we just consider this cat AD. That's just a, a, a nice notational thing to do. So that's, uh, so that's what happens when we have two qubits. We're just going to take the tensor product of them, and that gives us one big old cat to work with. Occasionally, though, um, it may be advantageous not to take a tensor product, but um, as you do more and more of this math, you realize like, at what points you want to and at what points you shouldn't. Ah, OK, so now we get to the question that uh, I, I kept bringing up, or I kind of I was very handy in the last workshop, which is the, the measurement part, right? So I mentioned, well, okay, if you have your um, qubit here and it has some probability of being in zero plus some probability of uh, collapsing to one, uh, mathematically, how exactly do I show? Like, what's the what's the probability? And what happens here is uh, I want to introduce you to another component of the bracket notation. So I originally this is called a ket, but every ket has an associated bra with it. And what the bra is, is if I were to, oh, good Lord, if I were to take this and I take the complex conjugate of it, so what that means is if it has any complex entries, the sign in front of the imaginary component changes. So if it's negative, goes to positive, positive, and negative. And then I take the transpose of that. So this is a, a vertical vector, and now it's going to rotate over. So now it becomes a, a, a singular row vector instead of column vector. And it doesn't matter which order you do this. It's the same if you, yeah, go ahead. You can throw that little symbol, like the, the, the one, the conjugate symbol. I can't really make out what it's Oh, sorry. That's just, a, it's just like a little um, star. Yeah, uh, let me, hold on. Let me choose a finer, um, that's a good point. Let me choose a finer pen with, there we go. There it is. It's just a little star. And then we, uh, the T is just uh, transpose. So that's what, that gives us, uh, notationally, this is equivalent to this. So that's called a bra. Every cat has a bra. And what happens here is, okay, let's imagine I want to figure out using this example, uh, what the probability that I'm, what's the probability I will get zero if I'm, if I'm going to measure zero. So what we have to do here is I'm going to take zero and I'm going to convert it to a bra. So I take the complex conjugate and then I transpose it. Although you realize this has real entries, so no need to worry about the complex components. And then transpose, I just go ahead and push it on its side. So it comes out nice and happy. And that means this gives me this bra here. So if I go ahead and write it out, what should happen here is I want to measure it. This is usually what happens when we, when we denote that we're trying to measure the probability of something. Although this is incomplete, you, have, you still have to take the magnitude 
and, and square it. And that will give you a, a real value that will denote the probability that your qubit is going to be measured in, in, in terms of zero. And uh, I, I like to be verbose with my math just because this is our first time looking at this. And I always hate it when um, textbooks say this is an exercise left to the reader. That's like the worst thing anyone can ever do. But if we expand this, let's go ahead and expand this. Um, so psi, as I mentioned earlier, was equal to zero plus beta ket one. That um, bra, we go ahead and get um, distributed over. Oh, that's, that's me being a little too hasty with the pen. Zero. So then the zero can go here. And then we can also do this as well. And I, oh gosh, I, I've, I've already jumped the gun here. I should have mentioned what exactly this represents when you, when you have a, a bra and you multiply it with a cat. That's, a, uh, that's an inner product. So the dot product in, in uh, linear algebra, so you remember, if you ever have uh, two vectors and you take the dot product, that measures the amount of overlap between the two uh, dot products here. So if we look at this, um, I mentioned before that the zero and one vectors are, are perfectly um, orthonormal, they're orthogonal to each other. So if I'm asking myself, well, how much does vector one overlap with zero? It's zero, there, there, there's no overlap because they're perfectly orthogonal. So this goes to zero. And as a result, this coefficient doesn't even see the light of day. But here, um, the overlap of zero with itself is one. It's, it's you know, there's a hundred percent overlap. They're perfectly aligned with each other. So that gives me a one. And then I'm left with alpha. Of course, it's just still incomplete. Uh, you saw that I encapsulated it in terms of the, uh, I took the magnitude and I squared it. So we go ahead and square it. And that will give us the probability that we're in, that we're going to measure zero. Um, and like you do the same thing for one. So if I had, if I wanted to measure what chance I get one, I have to do the procedure again. So I take the complex conjugate and then transpose it. And that will give you the bra one. And then you apply that bra to your cats. And I mentioned this is like a child playing with puzzle pieces because it is intentionally designed. Uh, the direct bra cat notation is intentionally designed such that if whenever you see a, a scenario like this, that means like, oh, okay, we're just taking the, um, the dot product here. So that's, um, that's, that's what I mean when you are uh, measuring the probability that you'll uh, measure something. Uh, when this recording goes up, I'll have sources linked, like additional resources so you guys can check it out in case you wanna um, really play around with the math yourself. Uh, I took this, uh, uh, this example from the Qiskit textbook. So if you don't know what that is, Qiskit is the IBM's um, quantum information science kit. It's a very friendly um, uh, and, and pretty powerful framework for doing quantum computing simulations. Ah, okay, now we get to some, uh, some more properties here. And I understand I'm, I'm kind of inundating you with all these different properties that don't seem quite related to each other, but that's why I'm hoping to cover um, that one algorithm, or the, uh, technically two algorithms, Deutsch and deutsch hose because that is where you will get to see all that math and action, and it all kind of come together in one package. And so far, everything makes sense or following along pretty well. If you, if you have any like questions, feel free to um, bug me once again. Okay, cool. So now I want to talk about um, phase. So you know, I mentioned earlier that we have this cat that represents a singular qubit. It doesn't have to be a singular qubit. It could be uh, two qubits as I showed earlier. Uh, but the basic idea here is there's uh, occasionally what happens with certain operations is they introduce what's called a, a global phase. So if you think of uh, in a, a complex number, which is represented in polar form, r e to the power by theta, um, and usually um, when we say phase, this is by default set to one. This is by default set to one. This is what we consider the phase. And a global phase is what happens when you get when you apply this coefficient to all the different um, uh, all the possible states. Let me let me go ahead and write that out to um, show you guys what that looks like. So e i theta alpha zero plus e i theta, and this is what. Oh, whoops, I forgot the theta here. So whenever you have a, a global phase, you can drop it. It, it. it doesn't do anything to the system. Mathematically, it looks like it does something. But whenever we're, we're performing that measurement, like we're getting the actual physical information from the system, the global phase doesn't do anything. It, it has no measurable or physical impact. So as a result, um, you'll, I'm taking this from, uh, this is a, a, it's from a nice lecture from, uh, I guess for Dr. Ozal at the University of Cambridge. But he basically has the notation here that, that sums it up in a. So remember how I told you the probabilities are like this, right? Alpha squared will give us some, uh, some probability. Well, if you, if you chuck in the uh, EI theta and then you do the alpha squared, this is exactly equivalent for all possible theta um, 
this is just equivalent to this. It has the, the global phase that gets applied to both of the probabilities or the um, complex probability amplitudes has, has no impact on physical measurement. So as a result, um, most of the times you'll see me, you'll see me do some manipulations for the algorithm that will introduce a global phase. And I'll show you, it's very, it's a very trivial thing to just pop the global phase off and your numbers come out a lot nicer without sacrificing, uh, without having to worry like, oh my God, is this gonna change like the physical phase? That being said though, there's, a, there's, a, there's also a relative phase, right? So global phase applies to all the complex amplitudes. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, give an example here. This is, a, this is a qubit state, and this is a qubit state you'll see very often, um, and then minus one. So if you measure the, uh, the amplitudes, right, the probability of getting zero and the probability of getting one, for both of them, they're the same. You still get a 50-50 chance. But you'll notice that the coefficient in front of the one and the one here are different by a factor of uh, EI theta. In fact, the difference is equal to uh, negative one here. And as a result, it's, this actually has an impact on physical measurement. Not in the zero one basis, if we're trying to measure the probabilities of zero and the probability of one, Son of a probability of, of one, you wouldn't see any uh, differences here, but I want to push your minds here and ask, well, why did I bother originally calculating the probability of measuring in, in zero or the probability of measuring in one? This is what we call the computational basis in, in normal quantum computing, but there's nothing limiting me to only using those vectors. I could have picked a, another vector um, with any arbitrary component, so long as it follows the probability I mentioned, or the, the property I mentioned earlier, that it has to have a, a length of, of one. And I'll just make up something like, a, a, like my stuff vector, which is, you know, it just follows the properties. I could have measured these, um, the probabilities of these two qubits collapsing into the stuff state. Of course, it would have been written like this. It would have been a bra. And then I apply the bra to each of the each of the cats in here, and that will give me the probabilities getting stuff. But it turns out that if I use a different basis, then it becomes detectable. There is a physical difference between the the plus and the minus here. That's what we call the relative phase. Whereas with the global phase, um, there's no there's no discernible difference there. And that phase thing, you know, why am I bringing up phase? It'll, it'll come, Deutsch Hose needs that property of global and relative phase. That's exactly how it, it's kind of the secret sauce to um, why it's, it makes for such a powerful algorithm. Any, any questions so far? Everyone's doing all right, pretty quiet. I understand it's Friday. Everyone's wanting to like get the hell out of here and, and enjoy the weekend. I totally understand. I, I spent uh, from like 7 a.m. to now just reviewing, make sure these numbers check out right. So I'm in the same boat as you guys, but I also uh, love quantum computing, so. I'm conflicted here. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. So now that we, we've got all this knowledge of, of bras and cats down, uh, we want to do useful stuff with the qubits now. We want to manipulate them, perform calculations. And the, the key to that is what we call gates. And these gates will manipulate your individual um, vectors here. So I mentioned one qubit is a, a two entry vector here. Well, a gate is uh, for a singular qubit, for a singular qubit, a gate is nothing more than a, a two by two matrix. It's a, a, a two by two matrix. And it's not, it can't just be any matrix. There's, there's a very peculiar property these matrices have to fall, and it's called a unitarity. Uh, it has to be a, a unitary matrix. What exactly uh, does the unitary property mean? Well, if I take that matrix, I'll call the matrix um, A. If I take the adjoint, oh, I should have mentioned this earlier. I'm already tripping myself up, but I showed you this little symbol earlier that converts a um, it converts a, a ket to a, a bra. This is called the adjoint, which is just the uh, you take the complex conjugate and you do the transpose. You can do this for matrices too. Um, there's nothing stopping you from taking the complex conjugate and transposing a matrix. It's just linear algebra. But if I take the adjoint times itself, this is equivalent to this, which is equivalent to the identity. So that's a property that every Qubit. Every operation on a quantum computer um, has to be unitary, except for measurement. Measurement itself is not a, a unitary function, but that's because it, it, it does something else um, quite different from other gates. So yeah, every operation on a quantum computer has to follow this property of being unitary. And the, if you want to keep in mind, like uh, a neat way to remember this is unitary has the word unit in it, and that's very good, uh, good naming because every unitary matrix, if I give a vector of, of length one, like uh, all the, all the uh, vectors that represent qubits are, have like a magnitude of length of one, and I apply a unitary matrix to it, it preserves that magnitude. 
So the, the matrix in question, like uh, if I apply this to psi, and this is how you would apply a, a gate. You just put the, um, the matrix or the symbol for it in front of your ket. Um, if this changes the underlying uh, probability, so I'll say uh, alpha prime zero plus uh, beta prime one, just say they change, these still are guaranteed to follow, oh, good Lord. These are still guaranteed to follow the property that their magnitude squared, and you take the sum, it still equals one. So the length of that vector is still guaranteed to be one, unitary, because it preserves the unit vector nature of the qubit. Every gate, every operation in quantum computing will be unitary. In fact, I want you to keep that in mind because for Deutsch Hose, I mentioned like, oh, we're gonna evaluate f of x, a function. But it turns out it's not as easy as just taking f of x and slapping it into the computer. We have to convert f of x into a unitary operation. And then we can have some fun with Deutsch Hose. But luckily for you, I'm not gonna, uh, I won't give you any more like math to show you how that's done. I'll just, I'll show you an example and, and it'll, it'll, it's just gonna be unitary. I'll just put it out there. There are two gates that I want you guys to learn today. I'm only keeping it to two gates because that's all Deutsch Hose actually needs, two gates. Um, the function itself may need another kind of, uh, another set of gates, but I'm not, uh, I don't think I'll need to show that because I don't wanna bog you down with too much already because I know this is already a lot. I, I know this is definitely a lot. This is, I have condensed what took me maybe, a, a, you know, several months to learn like two years ago into something I think will fit in, in today's allotted time. So the, the two gates that I want you to learn are the X gate and the um, H gate. H is short for a uh, Hadamard and the X gate um, is short for, well, it's not really short for anything. Um, there's actually an origin for why it's called the X gate, but because I haven't introduced the visual representation of these qubit states, it might not make uh, too much sense for now. But all you need to remember is that if you're given um, a qubit that's you know, all in the zero state, um, you'll get what the, uh, it converts it to the one state. And if you get a qubit that's in the one state, it converts it to the zero state. This is considered like quantum not gate. It just inverts um, one and zero and then uh, zero to one. Although in reality, it does a, it does a rotation. And, and I can't, I didn't bother showing you guys the blocks here. So it doesn't make sense um, when I say rotation. But in, in the next workshop, I'll probably uh, tack it on in the beginning. Versus the, uh, now the Hadamard. The Hadamard is uh, a rather peculiar gate. The Hadamard is what allows us to get into a superposition state. It's how we get from uh, a default value, like classical value of zero uh, to the 50-50 uh, chance of, of zero and one. So this gives us ket zero plus one over root two. And if you do the math here, um, is a 50-50 chance of, of zero and one. And uh, a lot of times, this is standard notation in, in many quantum uh, algorithms. Whenever a Hadamard acts on a zero, this, this entire thing, we like to keep it in shorthand. We put a ket with a little plus in it. If the Hadamard acts on a one, um, it's pretty much the same thing, except the relative phase here has changed. So now it's root two, and we denote that with a minus. So it's the equivalent representation. So the Hadamard just gets us from a classical you know, zero or a classical one, and it brings us to um, these two states here. And it might seem kind of like, like oh, what, what happened when we have one cat, now we have two of them. But it turns out it's just, um, this is still uh, a valid single qubit state. It's just, uh, I've just added uh, a probability coefficient to zero and, and one, but I've gone ahead and put them in like one little condensed package for you. Oh, and uh, I did mention earlier the two by two, uh, two by two matrices. So X looks like this. It looks like an identity matrix, but the other way around. So this is what X looks like. And this is what H looks like. It's one over the square root of two and then one, 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 negative one. So that's what your uh, X and H gates look like. They're just matrices. They're just make all you're doing is perform matrix multiplication and you have your, um, your qubit vector sitting here. Uh, one thing I wanna mention uh, uh, is uh, if you're applying uh, your operations to a, a qubit. So if I have the state of psi here, and I, want, I apply an X to it. This is very intuitive. I just do the matrix multiplication. But what happens if I want to apply X and then uh, H? Well, it turns out you don't write X, H, Psi. This is, this is wrong because the order of matrix multiplication, even though we're technically going um, from X to H, you flip it the other way around when you're doing the multiplication. So it's actually this way. Your first operation is closest to the vector and your last operation is 
the furthest away. But all this is hiding is just traditional matrix multiplication. No, no fishy business there. Okay, so no, no questions so far. Everything seems to check out. Everyone's pretty happy. Everyone, everyone wants to head on their Friday. I, I understand. I haven't had lunch yet, so. <laughs> so that being said, uh, I, I showed you how to do two qubits. What about two gates? How do, you, how do I represent the um, fact that I may have a, a two qubit state? So this is actually equivalent to zero, zero here. And, and, and then I have a gate that I want to apply to each of these individual qubits simultaneously. So if I had uh, an X gate, so the one just denotes that this is you know, qubit one and then X two, I just want to denote here. So I'm applying two gates on these two qubits. And uh, I mentioned it earlier, this is a four entry vector. So this is a four rows by one column. So surely we have to find a way to get the two gates here, which are two by two matrices to become a four by four matrix. And once again, it's the tensor product to the rescue again, because all you do here is you just take the tensor product of uh, X one and then X two. So we remember what, uh, uh, I'm not gonna draw the whole thing out because I've already pressed the time here. I got 20 minutes to explain an algorithm that took me a decent amount of time to work on. Uh, but basically the entries for X one, uh, if you remember were zero, one, one, and zero. And then you just multiply this times, uh, well, you don't need the brackets here, but X times X times X times X. This is like a nested almost four matrices in one matrix. But this comes out to a four by four. And this is compatible with the dimensions for that. So if you have a, a four by four matrix representing uh, two gates in one go, and then you have um, your state vector here, that's what it's called, a state vector. Um, you can just do matrix multiplication and that will give you the uh, new, new result there. It's a tensor product for, um, if you have multiple gates that are acting on uh, uh, the two qubits. Oh, and if you only have uh, one gate acting on a singular qubit, we just inject the identity. So this would have been X1, I2, so zero, zero. So that means that X will be applied to the one qubit, but nothing happens to the second qubit. We just put the identity in. Okay, that's almost all of it. And then, oh, there's one last, or two last properties of um, the direct broadcast notation. And you're probably be grateful that I introduced it to you now uh, before some, uh, some textbook decides to give some overly convoluted explanation. So I mentioned that we have uh, a cat and you have a bra and we can do this, right? You can, you can take a bra and then you put a cat in front of it and this is the inner product. But there's another operation called the outer product and that involves this. You have a cat and then you have uh, a bra here. And the outer product is kind of handy for representing um, certain gates relative to certain uh, uh, positional states or uh, what we would call the eigenstates and eigenvalues. And if you're eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and if you know what that is, I'll, I'll just give a brief example. So if we have a, a matrix here and some vector, then there could be the possibility is, uh, there might be some coefficient here, uh, an integer maybe, and then it keeps the same cat. So this is the same cat, but this is some number say a negative one. So usually you know, if you have like a two by two matrix and a, a, two, uh, a vector with two entries, you can think of it almost like a, a rotation operation. But um, with uh, any matrix, you can find, uh, I, I gotta be careful with any matrix, but usually uh, the matrices will have an associated eigenvector. And the eigenvector has a property where if you apply the matrix on it, it just seems like you're scaling the, the vector. You're not rotating, you're just scaling the length or the magnitude of that vector. So then it just has this associated, um, you can just represent it as singular values here. And, and what this means, is you can represent gates like the, uh, I'm gonna represent the Hadamard, for example. It had that kind of uh, ugly looking uh, matrix representation. I can make it look a hell of a lot nicer by performing the following action here. Uh, I mean, zero plus minus one. So I've taken, uh, and, and this, this doesn't make too much sense now, but I'll, I'll give a quick example here. If I were to put, uh, so remember that when I apply the Hadamard to zero, it's going to give me this vector here and plus a shorthand for well, what I showed earlier. But what happens with, uh, now that we know some basic rules of broadcast notation, I can say like, okay, we'll pretend this is the Hadamard. This represents the Hadamard here. And then you have a, oh, not a plus, uh, you have your zero here, right? Your, your uh, zero cat. And if I were to take the inner product, so, so I distribute this cat out and we notice, well, the inner product of one and zero is going to be zero. They're, they're perfectly perpendicular to each other. There's no overlap. So as a result, 
um, you're not going to get that associated vector. But there's a 100% overlap with uh, zero because it's just zero by itself. It's the same vector overlapping. So this becomes a one. So as a result, my final result is the, the plus vector. So this, this uh, 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 outer product notation is pretty much identical to, uh, you, you can represent um, dates with it as well. If you know the eigenvectors, as well as their associated eigenvalues. If, they, if uh, the Hadamard doesn't have any explicit eigenvalues here, but um, if, if you do, you, we will encounter gates that do have them, in which case you just put the coefficient um, in front there because coefficients um, aren't, they're not restricted by the dimensions of your vectors, so they can hop around freely. You can, you can move them um, all the way to the front without any penalties. Oh, and I should, I should mention what this looks like. This is just a normal uh, matrix multiplication. So if your um, uh, you know, your ket looks like this, Okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just do it down here. Your, your ket will look like this, but then your bra will look like this. And um, if you look at the dimensions here, this is a, a two entry two by one, and this is a, a one by two. So this will have to give you a, a matrix here, a two by two. Whereas the inner product, I want you to recognize, um, so we're doing it the other way around. This is, uh, no, sorry, this is a one by two. And then this is also a, a, a two by one. And we pair the dimensions together, and this will give you, it has to give you a single value. It has to give you a, a single value here. So that's the outer product and the inner product. Okay, cool. And then here's like the last property, and I'm gonna get the algorithm. I recognize, oh my goodness, we have 15 minutes. So I don't know if I can get to the Deutsch Hose part, but we can cover the Deutsch part. That should be easy enough to cover. Let me keep scrolling up here. I don't know, it's once again, it's that weird resolution thing. I don't have like a quarter of my display for doodling, so. But now that we have this knowledge, uh, the, what, the last thing I wanna teach you guys is linearity. Linearity is a very neat property to uh, work with here. So I mentioned how um, the X gate has this property, right? If I apply it to a qubit with state zero, it's gonna give me one. And if I apply it to a one, we just go back to zero. And, but let's say I have an arbitrary qubit basis. So it, it has some complex value here, um, zero plus beta. One. You guys were lucky I, I did the recording for the last workshop at home. I actually edited out all the times I, I say damn it or some other um, rather uh, impolite language. But um, if I apply X to this, we can use the idea behind linearity is that you can apply the X to all the underlying basis states, which makes it, a, it makes it very nice to work with. So as a result, this is the equivalent to alpha X zero plus, plus X beta one. And we know what happens when an X gets applied to a zero, it just becomes a one. And when F, this is the other way around, sorry, beta X one. Oh, we know what happens when X is applied to a one, it just becomes zero. So as a result, this just becomes alpha one plus beta zero. So linearity is the property where anytime you see like a, a, a summation followed by um, the individual kets here, you can take that matrix or that date and you can distribute it amongst the underlying vectors. And you're gonna see that plenty of times over when I introduce this algorithm. Okay, maybe I'll just cover Deutsch's algorithm. I, I'll, maybe I'll have to save Deutsch Hose for like a separate recording or something. But um, I, I, I severely uh, underestimated how long it would take to cover. But then again, I'm, I'm condensing what might be worth a, a good amount of undergraduate uh, uh, physics material into a couple of sheets of paper from my mind. So that means that let's get to talk about uh, Deutsch's algorithm. And Deutsch's algorithm solves a problem that uh, it's one of those classic cases in, in science where, where people solve problems that nobody asked for. But the hope is that you, you publish all these papers and sooner or later someone will cite it and then the H index goes up. Uh, but luckily I'm not a postdoc. I'm, I'm just living my undergraduate um, life here. So <laughs> the idea behind uh, Deutsch's algorithm is let's imagine I gave you a function, f of x. For Deutsch's algorithm, we're going to say this function can only take uh, one bit. So I can either plug in a one or I can plug in a zero. That's it. Deutsch Hose is a generalization of this algorithm where I can apply on any number of bits into the function, so long as the domain supports it. And I'm gonna, I wanna answer the question, uh, is, it, is it constant or is it balanced? Constant or balanced? So what, what exactly do I mean if a, a function is constant or balanced? Well, if it's constant for any value I plug in, f of zero or f of one, I'm going to get the same output. So it can either be all ones or it could either be all zeros. For a balanced function, um, it just means that next input has to be the opposite of the other one. So if this is a one, this would be a zero. 
And if this is a, a zero, this would be a, a one. This is only about balancing a constant. So for a normal computer, let me ask you, how many times would you have to poke f of x to figure out, or evaluate f of x to figure out if it's um, constant or balanced? Just, just normal, though. like no, no quantum computer. I'm just asking you as a person. Exactly. So you have to uh, evaluate it um, twice to figure out if it's uh, um, uh, constant or balanced. But for quantum computing, we only have to do it once. It's just a singular evaluation. And we take advantage of all that quantum parallelism stuff that I was talking to you guys about earlier. So before I introduce the math, I'm going to set up the, um, the gates that I mentioned. I talked about those gates earlier. I'm going to draw a physical diagram of what we're going to do. And then I'm going to go ahead and, and show you uh, some of the underlying math here. So let's see. So I took this um, from, there's a website called Quantum Inspire um, that has the full uh, circuit for it. I like, the, um, I like their representation better than what IBM shows you. But uh, OK, so here we go. So let's put an X gate here. I'm just, and then you can and you have a, a H followed by an H, followed by this big old two qubit gate here. Are you, a lot of texts just call it UF. It's just F of X, but termed unitary. Think of it that way. And then this, we consider this uh, X and Y. And then X comes out um, unchanged here from U of uh, UF. And then, but for this, this thing, we do a very interesting thing here. We do Y and then we do a ZOR. You can think of it as ZOR. It's actually addition mod two, but uh, I, I, just, I like to call it ZOR just because um, yeah, it's more familiar that way. So this is, I've drawn what's called like a circuit diagram. So you have one qubit here in, in ket zero and one qubit here also in ket zero. And uh, you'll see like, uh, you know, for all these quant different quantum algorithms, we'll have like what these circuit diagrams. Every box you see is some gate, like that matrix that I was talking about earlier. And then this, uh, this, this huge square here with the, um, that uh, encapsulates two of these uh, wires. Each wire carries like a, a qubit to it. Is a, a two qubit gate. And then you see if we can go back here. And then uh, eventually uh, you'll see a sign here. Um, that's what we mean when we perform a, a measurement. Just like it looks like a little meter. That's what we want to figure out, was well, it a, a zero or is it a one? So let's, let's walk through this because we can split this algorithm up into multiple steps here. I just call this uh, one, two, three, I think this is four and then five. I might not follow that order, but, uh, but it's just the idea is like you can go step by step. So we're trying the very beginning. We just have two qubits. So we can, we can write them out like this. And we know, um, if you take the tensor product, you could also write it like this, but there's a very good reason why I'm not tensoring them immediately. On the next uh, operation here, so you notice that on, on zero, I'm not doing anything. I, I leave it as it is, but on the second one, I, I'm going to flip it. I'm going to turn it into a one. So now we go from the above to a zero followed by a one here. Okay, nothing too fishy here. And now I'm going to apply the two Hadamard gates. So what do the two Hadamard gates do? Well, let's go ahead and, and, and show it like this. So that would look like this. So if I were to write it all out, if I'm being explicit, this is what it looks like, H1. So you can, you can do this as well. So that even though these are two are, are tensor together, this would equal um, zero, one, if they were tensor together, um, I keep, I'm keeping them separate for now. I can apply the, the Hadamard to each individual qubit. So as a result, um, I'm going to get something that looks like this. One over root two, and then this is zero minus one over root two. So, so that's if you remember in the very beginning, I showed you what the Hadamard does to just the zero and one. It gives you the um, very similar states, but the relative phases are different by factors negative one. So, that's a, so I'm keeping them separate. But now, um, in order to uh, apply the uh, the function here, I'm going to have to uh, combine them together. And I want to uh, briefly describe in, uh, in a bit of detail what exactly it is that U of F does. So this is X and, and this is Y. This, I'm just, the X and Y come from the two labels here. And what, the, what I'm promising you that that black box function does is it does this. It does, um, this is equivalent to, oh, yeah, I need to rewrite that. X stays by itself, but um, now this is Y um, and then the addition mod two, or you can think of it as the ZOR, of f of x. So I took, I took this x, and, and you see it's evaluated on, in here as well. And this is unitary. This is unitary. So it does follow the, the, the resulting matrix for u of f will follow on the same properties that I showed earlier. Uh, but one of the interesting things, though, I'm not going to just detail it here. You can do it for yourself. It's reversible. So if I took the output 
and I plugged it back in, I could get the original input. That's something that'll come up very common in quantum computing. Is that you have to have reversibility um, for uh, all your operations. So now, with, now we're at uh, stage three. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is combine. I'm going to combine all these states because we learned about the tensor product, right? So we shouldn't be scared if we um, go ahead and, and, and uh, take the dive here and really glue everything together. So these coefficients are one over root two. We're just going to multiply them together. That's one half. And now we just distribute out. So if we look here, this is ket zero, ket zero, um, then minus ket zero, one, plus one, zero, and then minus one, one. So we'll, this is not supposed to, I, I've, I've spoiled the plan I was going to have here, but this is one, and then this is one, and then this is a, that's a parenthesis. I'm reaching the edge of my tablet here. Five minutes. Yeah, I'm seeing the clock here. I think I'm going to pull it off in five minutes. Bear with me. So now that all these, uh, these are all tensor producted together. So this is just zero, zero, minus zero, one, plus one, zero, minus um, one, one. And we have the one half out there. We, got, we have to keep that one half around. That's the normalization. That makes sure that if, we, if I measure all the probabilities, they're all going to be equal to one. Now we apply um, U of F. So if I were to apply, uh, technically it would have been better if I had kept the representation like this, because you can map each of these like individual kept. This is actually your X and this is your Y. This is your X and this is your Y. They all get plugged in um, to the X and Y you see here on the um, U sub F here. But basically what happens now is we are going to have a state that looks something like this. And I'm going to untensor it. I, I shouldn't have, I just tensored it to show you like, okay, you can, it's, you're just counting in binary here all the way from zero to, um, so I'm spanning all the possible inputs of that, um, of that unitary function. But if this is X, then the Y should look like, so this is a, a zero on the Y. So I, this is zero and then F of X, X is zero. So it looks like that. And then if I were to do it again here, this is still zero, and then I have, but I have a one, so that's one mod, uh, one addition modulo two, and then f of zero, because I, I'm plugging in the x, this is our x, and then, uh, right, okay. I have one here uh, for that state here, and then this would also be zero mod, there we go. F of zero, and then this would be a uh, let's see here, minus one, and this would be one, one. Okay, so that's what happens when I apply um, U of F. And you notice I applied U of F to every single entry here. So that's linearity at work. If U of F could be applied to one uh, or two qubits, then if I have a superposition state, I can take the U of F. And I can I can distribute it out to each of these basis states. That's that's linearity at work. Makes the math a lot nicer. So now this this looks uh, you know this looks all very convoluted and whatnot. But I got I got to boil it down in some way. So if I have uh, let's see we'll go back to we're going to keep our, our one half here. I'm going to point out some interesting properties here. Anytime you have zero and you do the addition modulo two, uh, I'll probably I should this is probably helpful. Um, I'll just write out the uh, table for you. So zero, and then you take you add a zero, that's still zero. Zero, you know, one, that's one. One, you add a zero, that's still one. But one and one are a, are a zero. That's addition modulo two. Um, or, or the Zor gate, the exclusive or. So as a result, uh, we can simplify what we see here um, uh, in this expression. So we can, anytime you see a zero, uh, addition mod two, with f of zero, you can just pretend that just by itself. Uh, this we should hold on to for now, but I'll, I'll explain why that's not a concern here. And then this is also, um, you have to get rid of that, but then you've got to keep the, the ones here. So there are two cases I mentioned earlier. You know, the function can either be balanced or can either be constant. So that's going to give us two different results here. And I'm going to uh, tackle the case uh, where it's constant. So when it's constant, we can agree that f of zero is equal to f of one. Regardless of if the output is uh, consistently zero or consistently one, all we care about is that their, their outputs are equal. So if I go back um, up here, I think what I'll go ahead and do is um, let, me, let me make sure that I have, I gave you guys the right numbers here. This should be uh, zero, 
This is plus one. Oh, whoops. Okay, this is a little inaccurate here. This is not a zero, excuse me. This is a one. In here should be a, a one. Just making sure. So I'm going to go ahead and, and with this knowledge in mind, with this knowledge in mind, we're going to go ahead and simplify it. But I also want to notice uh, another property here, which is that if I ever see an f of one, you can agree that I can convert that to an f of zero. So as a result, you're going to get you're going to get something like this. Um, and, and in this state, I've gone ahead and uh, distributed out everything already. So you know, let me let me go ahead and, and because I don't like I don't like skipping steps. I like to be thorough on my work. Zero, zero, zero. Oh, this is painful. I'm sorry, guys. I gotta keep dragging the whiteboard with me. One, and then there's the f of, or no, that's not f. This is actually zero mod of one, uh, modulo, uh, addition modulo two. And then you have your minus here. This is the one, and this is one mod. Come on, dude. This is one mod f of one. Okay, cool. Now, what happens here is that uh, you have you have these uh, zeros here, and you have the ones, and you can actually factor out the, the zero ket here. So this will actually become zero, and then this would be uh, the ket of f of zero uh, minus. Oh, good lord, I'm, I'm being sloppy here. I didn't even bother to. Uh, and you can have one zero here then plus you have your uh, one here and then you can see I can I can just I'm just moving the one outside the parentheses because you can, you can distribute this one inside the press the uh, it's an equivalent expression and then you have zero mod um, f of one zero mod f of one and then minus one mod f of one damn it come on Is this handwriting readable? Is this like hard to read? It's hard to read. Like, I mean, okay, okay. I, I appreciate the feedback just so I can, I can try and slow down a bit. I realize I'm, I'm over time. So if, you, if any of you guys have to head out, um, feel, it, it's okay because this is recorded. So you can revisit the recording if you want to. If you have an extra, I, I think I just need uh, 10, 10 more minutes. Um, it'd be much appreciated. But if not, I don't wanna, I wanna hold you hostage or anything. So now we've, oh, and then I put a parenthesis here. So you notice that this is still the same expression as the above. That's meant to be a minus sign, by the way. This, is a, this should be up here, not dangling at the bottom. So now we can do some simplifications. Uh, if we look, I wonder. I want you guys to keep in mind that f of zero is equal to f of one, right? You know, there's no uh, because it's a constant function. So as a result, this f of one here can be treated as an f of zero. And likewise, this one mod f of one can be treated as an f of zero. And this comes out to be very nice because what that means now is I can take this whole thing and it turns out that you condense it into uh, two individual uh, qubit states here. Thanks for dropping by uh, and, and for your patience as well. I, I realize it's running long. Thank you. Much appreciated. This becomes, uh, so this might look a little familiar now. I've, I've popped, I, I've kind of yanked the distribution. So now they're into two different, um, two different categories here. And then you see that we have f of zero here minus um, one mod f of zero. So this is our two qubit state now. So we, we came from these two states, these, these two states were identical. I made them identical because f of one is equal to f of zero, the constant functions. So now we've got, on this state here. And I can tell you right off the bat, this, this one over root two, uh, a one over two we can distribute now. So it's, this just becomes a root two, and this becomes a, a root two as well. This looks like our familiar friend, the uh, ket plus here. But now I want to pay attention, pay uh, some close attention here. We have f of zero, and then one mod uh, f of zero here. And what happens is, okay, let's imagine there are two cases we can deal with, f of zero and f of one, uh, both equal to one or they both equal to zero. Either way, we're gonna get the same result, but the global phase will be different. And I'll show you 
uh, what happens. So if, if f of zero is equal, if they're both equal to one, then what happens is this qubit now takes the value um, one minus, and then one zor one is zero. So this becomes zero over over root two. If I, if I if you missed the other stuff, let me know. I can scroll back up. If you want me to? I just, there we go. That uh, becomes one minus a uh, kid zero root two. We don't really like, I mean, a, a nicer way, an equivalent way to express this, I should say, is you could do negative zero plus one. You guys can agree with me there? All I've done is flip the order. But it turns out that I can factor out uh, a negative phase here, like a global negative phase. So this uh, then just becomes a, uh, a negative here, and then it's ket zero minus one. And this negative is global, so we can ignore it. It has no effect on the resulting computation. But as a result, that means that my first qubit is a, a plus, and my second qubit is a minus. And if we go all the way back to the beginning, that's exactly how we started out. Um, because I, I, at this point here, at this point here, you had a plus and you had a minus. Uh, if you don't believe me, at, at step three, right? This this qubit here, um, you can represent as a plus, and this can represent as a, a minus. So nothing changed for a constant function. Nothing changed, but for I, I'm going to really save some time here. Uh, I'm not going to go through the derivation again, but inevitably, what happens is if you have a balanced function, it turns out that well, I'm, I'm cutting some steps. We, we can go through the same uh, uh, simplifications again, although there is a, a minor caveat that f of one does not equal f of zero anymore. So I can't use that simplification, but you can still get to this final state here. And I, I believe me, I wanted to show some more detail here, but I, I understand I'm pressing the time limit for the two. And then the final qubit here looks very different. It looks like this. You notice there's an f of one where the original, um, the original, uh, uh, this, this was originally one mod f of zero. Now it's f of one. This is what happens when you uh, take the you take a scenario that f of one is not equal to f of zero anymore. And furthermore, I want you to notice something else. In in the last calculation, when the function is constant, this vector was a, a there was a plus sign here. Now it's a minus. There's a property called phase kickback. Phase kickback. Phase kickback. So let's let's go, if you look at the diagram again, you're going to find it very weird. Why is it that even though the result comes out on this qubit? All my attention, like the, the measurement and the other operations, are focused on the input. It turns out that when you're working with uh, um, the uh, this kind of black box, we're taking advantage of a property that I, I mentioned earlier, phase kickback. What happens is the impact or the result that should have affected that you would intuitively think would affect the qubit here literally gets kicked up to your uh, target cube, up to the x qubit. And as a result, we perform a manipulations on the um, x qubit here. And that's how we figure out if this is a, a balanced or constant function. Because what happens is that this is, still, this is still negative, but now your output here is negative as well. For, um, for, these, for the case that f of zero does not equal f of one. And if you put this to the Hadamard again, by the way, so this was our, um, this is the uh, uh, x qubit or the x value for the unitary function. I'll go back up here. And there was this uh, x here. And then I, I apply the Hadamard again that gives me a, uh, well, not a one. Uh, no, it does, it does. Uh, it gives me a one. But for the balance function, it gives me a, a zero. So we're, what happens in the, uh, so you don't see phase kickback when the, when the function is, uh, is constant, when f of one is equal to f of zero. But in the scenario where f of one is not equal to f of zero, it's balanced, the phase or the, the change that was supposed to happen on your result qubit gets kicked up to your, um, your input qubit. And then we perform our remaining uh, operations on that qubit there. So I think I will, I will leave it at that. I wanted to go over Deutsch Hose, which is a generalization, but I don't know if you guys can see my notes. These are my personal lecture notes. There's plenty more content. Um, so I think I'll go ahead and, and stop the recording here. Go ahead and uh, end the meeting.